In this video, we're going to talk about friction and we're going to move towards an understanding, eventually, of terminal velocity. But to get there, we need to go through some basics. We need to understand how friction is different to other forces. We need to understand what causes friction and we need to understand how it works. Now you might be aware that from a point of view of energy, most of the forces that we apply, if we apply it through a certain distance, it means that we do some work. It means that we put some energy into the system. And this, for example, could result in a rise in the kinetic energy of the object. But friction is slightly different though, because what friction does is the opposite. In terms of the energy picture, some work is done against friction, and friction is the result of some pre-existing kinetic energy or some such thing. And so you can see how friction complicates our simplistic picture of forces, and that's why we need to treat it specially. Now scientists are still in disagreement about what exactly causes friction. You see, there are actually at least three competing processes, and this is present in uh, all objects that experience friction. And here on this table, I've got an example of the three main types. Now, you might find that a very rough surface gives you a lot of friction. You might find that a very smooth surface gives you a lot of friction. And that there gives this, um, this strangeness that how can two opposites uh, both produce the same result? It's because the different mechanisms of friction are uh, with different dominance in the different uh, situations. So here are those mechanisms. The first is deformation. I've got a, a large, heavy weight here on this deformable surface. And as it pushes up, it's actually creating a hump in front of it as it pushes along. Now, that there, creating that hump, means that it actually takes some energy to overcome it. And so this is, for soft surfaces, one of the main causes of friction. It's why you would get a lot of friction, for example, if you were sliding down a, like a sail from a sailboat. If the surface is flexible, you're going to deform the surface as you slide down. But there are two other mechanisms, and I want to show you those here. Have you ever wondered why sticky tape provides so much friction? Well, this is because of something known as adhesion. Adhesion is where you get bonds forming between one surface and the other. Adhesion. Now, sticky tape is actually sticky, so it's kind of obvious that bonds are going to form, connecting one to the other, and it takes a small amount of energy to break those bonds. But non-sticky surfaces can uh, experience adhesion too. I've got two plastic wallets here, and they, well, there's enough friction there to hold them together. I could pull them, and it does take a real amount of force to pull them apart, but they're smooth surfaces. It is because they are flat enough that they can get close enough together that the atoms in one piece of plastic can actually form bonds with the atom of the other. Now, this happens on very smooth surfaces. They can be surprisingly uh, frictiony. So if you imagine going on a slide, I'm sure nearly everyone has gone down a slide and received a friction burn. That is because of adhesion. Now, there is another mechanism I want to talk to you about, and that is what occurs when you have a very rough surface. Why does having a rough surface cause so much friction? Well, I've got here, this is something from the toolbox. It's like a giant cheese grater for like shaving wood off something. And it's very rough, very rough. I've also got here a saw, and that also has a very rough edge. And these are simulating the microscopic surfaces of two different objects. Now what happens is I try to draw one across the other is a vibration pushing this whole structure up and down. Now if one, and it's probably easier to see with a pair of saws, 
if one of these has to move up and down to overcome the little bumps of the other one, then of course what that is going to have to do is you're, you're inputting a little bit of energy uh, as gravitational potential energy every time it rises. And so all three of these mechanisms are a way of converting what could be kinetic energy, for example, into other forms of energy through this mechanism. We have deformation, we have adhesion, and we have the roughness of the surface. All of these are going to provide a force which we call friction. Understanding exactly what friction is and how it works takes a little bit of time. What I have here is an inclined plane with a kind of rough surface, and I have an object here which is going to quite happily just sit on that surface. Now, intuitively, if these were smooth surfaces, you'd realise that this would slide down the surface. If I increase the angle of this surface, eventually it would slide down, but you can see that this is actually, there we go, it is static. And so even before any motion occurs, friction can act to stop the motion. The, the tendency in this situation of the object to go downhill here is being stopped by the force of friction. This is a static situation, and what the friction is doing here is acting against the motion occurring in the first place. Now, friction can also have the effect of working against the motion of an object that is moving. So in this case, it's not static, it's moving. I've got a little dynamic trolley here with a spring. That spring's going to set it into motion over there and watch what happens. Now, it eventually stopped and that was because there was a force of friction acting in the opposite direction to the direction it was moving. It was moving forward, friction was acting backwards. So friction as a thing is definitely a force and it is measured in newtons. What we can do here is if I pull this small block of wood, the newton meter is reading a force of about 1.7 newtons of force pulling against this block before it starts to move. Technically, we have different types of friction here. We have static friction, which holds an object stationary when it is on uh, an inclined plane. And we have sliding friction, the friction present when it is just moving. And here, it is about 1.7 on that surface. And on this smoother surface, it is about 0.3, both measured in Newtons. There is, of course, one more kind of friction that is neither static nor is it uh, sliding, and that is what is demonstrated with a trolley. Here, if I attach the thing to this, you can see that this will move at 0.1 newtons. A different type of friction is present here, and this is rolling friction. Of course, it takes, for most objects, significantly uh, less force to overcome a rolling friction than it would do to overcome a uh, sliding or a static friction. And that's why the wheel was invented, to overcome such forces. How do we know that the force of friction always acts in the opposite direction to the motion? Well, here's an experiment that will demonstrate it to you. We have a light gate connected to a timer that is going to give us information about the acceleration of this object. Here, a double interrupt card will give us the acceleration as it passes through the light gate. Now, after a very initial acceleration caused by the spring, this car is going to free roll across this floor. In the absence of any friction, it would roll at constant velocity neither getting faster nor slower. But of course, this floor will have friction. So let's observe what that does to the motion of this object. We'll press play here. And now it's going, we'll release the trolley. And you can see here 
the acceleration of the object as it passed through was minus 0.32. What has happened is the acceleration was negative. Now, before we described that a positive acceleration was going to be in the direction you were travelling, and that a negative acceleration was going to be the result of an unbalanced force in the opposite direction to the direction that you described as positive. This is categorical proof that the force of friction always acts in the opposite direction to the direction you're travelling. The next thing we need to look at is what affects the amount of friction that we measure. Here I have the block of wood on the rough surface. It is smooth on the bottom side and that measures a friction of about 0.5 newtons. If I turn it over to the rougher side, then the amount of friction now measured is about 1.7 newtons. The difference, of course, was how smooth the surface was. This is a rougher surface, it gave more friction. How about the area in contact? So, 1.7 newtons went around on that side, this rough material continues on the side, so does it take more or less friction to pull it on the side? And we can see it doesn't go to 1.7, it hovers about 1.5. There is actually less friction when there is less surface area in contact. Finally, does the speed at which I pull this make any difference? So I'm pulling but it's now measuring about 1.5 at that speed and if I do it faster it's now measuring 1.5. It didn't make any difference in this circumstance how fast I pulled it. The friction was always the same. So to reiterate the two things that affect the amount of friction that I receive in a static sliding or rolling friction scenario are the uh, smoothness of the surfaces involved and the surface area that is in contact. In those situations where it was a solid surface acting on another solid surface, the static, the sliding, the rolling frictions, the only thing that mattered was the surface area and the roughness of the surface. What did not matter was how quickly one surface moved relative to another. But here is another kind of friction demonstrated with some guttering and a small polystyrene boat. You see, what this is going to demonstrate to us is a type of friction known as fluid resistance. It is very similar to the example of the deforming of the mat in the very first example in this video. That as something moves through a fluid, the fluid has got to move out of the way. And that uh, is going to take a small amount of energy, which when pulled over a distance is going to result in the force of friction. So, here we have the small little boat, and I'm going to get you closer to see what affects fluid resistance. So when I pull the boat through the water slowly, you can see it registers about 0.1 newtons. And that was pulling the square side forwards. If I instead pull the side that looks like the bow of a ship, you can see pulling at the same speed it doesn't even register any force at all. But what happened here is it mattered which way it went. The shape of the object affected the amount of fluid resistance. There was more fluid resistance with it going this way than there was when it was going that way. The second thing that I want to experiment is how quickly these objects move. So if I reposition myself on this side, if I pull this very gently, then what you can see is the fluid resistance is about 0.1 newtons. If I pull this much faster, did you see the newton meter went right up to several newtons of fluid resistance. And so in this situation where this water had to get out of the way, 
how fast you moved through it affected how much friction you encountered. There was more friction when you tried to move through the fluid faster. Now there is one other thing that affects the amount of fluid resistance. So if the shape of the boat makes a difference and the speed at which it moves through the water makes a difference, what about the water itself? Well here I have some thick gloopy glycerol and this is chemically different to water and that is actually producing the effect of it having a different viscosity. You can see it's really thick and gloopy. What I'm going to now do is I'm going to stick my boat in this. In it goes. Now what I notice in the gloopy liquid is that when I pull the newton meter, it instantly went straight up to two newtons, even when pulled at a slow speed, because it's thick. So fluid resistance depends upon not only the shape of the object, the speed at which it's being pulled through the medium, but also the viscosity of that medium, which makes sense. It's harder to swim through treacle than it is through water. It's kind of obvious that if an object pulled through a liquid experiences fluid resistance, then passing through any kind of fluid is going to meet with some opposition. Moving through the air is going to create a very particular kind of fluid resistance known as air resistance. Now it doesn't really matter whether or not I am moving through the air or whether or not the air is moving past me to create air resistance. I can simulate it in the lab by having the air move past me and I feel air resistance on me. You feel it when you go outside, it's known as the wind. But either way, we can explore air resistance in the lab with a few demonstrations. So is air resistance? like the other forces of friction that we have experienced. Well, it does have its similarities. For example, if I let this ball go, then its weight is going to pull it down. Now the air resistance in this case is going to be acting upwards because it is trying to act against the motion of the object, just like in all of the other cases of friction that we have seen that when this tries to move down, the air resistance acts in the opposite way. But what happens is it starts to accelerate downwards. To start with, it is not moving, and so there is no air resistance. But as it gets faster and faster, the air resistance gets larger and larger, until a point where the air resistance acting upwards is equal to the weight acting down. Now, if we can replicate that, rather than by dropping the ball, but by moving the air past it, you can see what we mean. So here, there is no air moving past it. So this is like when we first let go of the ball. But then the air starts to move past it, but still the weight is greater than the air resistance. As we fall a bit further and we get a little bit faster, and then you can see the air is moving much faster, and then eventually we get into the stage now where this ball has very little weight at all because the air resistance is pushing it upwards. Of course, we can get much faster air with this leaf blower, so let's give it a go. to the air resistance it's experiencing, and so it's balanced. And of course, this doesn't happen in a static situation all the time. What normally happens is this occurs when an object is falling. So let's go to the roof and have a look. Here we are on the roof. These ideas that we've had, the idea that, to start with, the force of weight is unopposed and it acts downwards, causing an object that is dropped 
to accelerate to ever greater speeds. But in a real world scenario, as it gets faster, the air resistance increases, which means that the unopposed downwards weight is now competing against another force, a force that is acting upwards. When these two forces become balanced, this will occur after the ball has accelerated to a certain speed and is now moving through the air. But now having reached that speed, a particular velocity, there is no resultant force anymore. The weight is equal to the air resistance for that object. This velocity we call the terminal velocity of a falling object, and it's different from one object to the next. These two balls may be the same dimensions, they may be the same size, but they have different weights. It means that if I dropped both of these, the heavy ball would have to be going faster to gain enough air resistance to counteract its heavier mass, which means that if dropped at the same time, this one would hit the ground first because this one would continue to accelerate after the point where this one has reached its terminal velocity. This one would hit the ground first because by the end it was travelling faster. And this gives us the impression that heavy things fall faster than light things. But they only do so because um, a heavy thing takes longer to reach its terminal velocity. Really, everything is experienced the same pull of gravity. And if there was no air here at all, then what we would find is these objects would hit the ground at exactly the same time. It is only the air resistance that is creating that impression of there being a difference between the two. Now, what this means for a skydiver is the following. To start with, when they jump, at that moment, the only force acting on them is their weight acting down. And not feeling anything opposing that weight, you would feel weightless for a second as you plummet towards the earth. Because of the downward force acting on you, you would accelerate downwards. Your velocity would get higher and higher and higher. But at some point, about here, you would now be experiencing air resistance. And that is going to get larger and larger until it balances the weight of the skydiver. From that point, no further acceleration can occur. And your skydiver now falls at that velocity that they reached. That is the terminal velocity. For a human being, the terminal velocity is really quite high. We are quite heavy for our size. And that means we have to be going really quick before our terminal velocity uh, is reached. And so we hit the ground at a unsurvivable speed. The terminal velocity of an object depends not only on their weight, but also on their shape. Just as with the fluid resistance, the boat pulled backwards through the water experienced significantly greater fluid resistance than when it was pulled forward. Increasing the surface area of our parachutist can have a dramatic effect on the terminal velocity. In fact, it means that the person can be falling at a much lower velocity when they reach their terminal velocity because there's a greater area catching that air. Now, this is why we use a parachute. It makes our terminal velocity something that we can survive. As well as being able to describe what is going on to the forces as the velocity increases, we may be asked to apply our knowledge in a more sophisticated way. We may be asked to draw a free body diagram of the forces as the velocity increases. So with a free body diagram, we represent the object as a dot in the middle of the diagram. Now, with something that is falling due to Earth's gravity, we would draw a straight line down representing the weight 
of the parachutist. Now I have two situations here, and the weight must be the same. So I've drawn it 17 centimetres long on there, I'll draw it 17 centimetres long there, and that should be a straight line. The weight does not change. There's always the same amount of weight pulling our parachutist down. It never changes. But what does change is the amount of air resistance. So I'm going to represent air resistance with this colour. The weight is accelerating the object downwards, meaning the velocity is downwards, meaning the air resistance acting in the opposite direction is going to have to be acting upwards. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to do two situations here, two free body diagrams to show you the difference. What can we see here? This is a few seconds after you've jumped out of the aeroplane. And what you can see is that the person is accelerating towards the ground. There is an acceleration still. And we know there is an acceleration because this force will not cancel out all of this force, meaning there will still be some downward force left over when all of the forces are considered. It is an unbalanced force and your acceleration is going to be in the direction of that unbalanced force, which means your acceleration is downward in the same direction as the unbalanced force. This is because weight is large and downward, and it's very important to reference in your answers the directions in which these forces are acting. Here, the air resistance is small, and upwards, which means the resultant force, the force you get when you add them all together, is still downward. And with a downward, unbalanced force, you're going to have that acceleration. The velocity increases. But it increases to a point when it reaches this second diagram here. The weight is large and downwards, and the air resistance is large and upwards, which means there is no resultant force, which means there's no acceleration anymore. It continues at whatever velocity it has reached, continues at a terminal velocity. And that is as fast as it's going to get. There's one more thing that they may ask us to do in terms of understanding this picture, and that is to draw a velocity time graph of this situation. So I'm going to draw it right next door, just on the board. So remember, all of the rules that we've learned about velocity time graphs are still true for this. And normally we only have to sketch what is going on. So here's my axes. We have velocity and we have time. Now one of the things that I have said is that velocity going downwards is going to be negative. So technically this should be below zero on this graph, but we kind of forget that. And we just imagine that perhaps we're more likely talking about speed, and that as the speed goes up, it's going to be a positive number. So you can see why there's a bit of a, a fudge there. But what will happen is, as uh, the person falls, their velocity will increase. And remember that the gradient of this graph gives you the value of the acceleration. We should find that the gradient of this graph in the first part is equal to 9.8 metres per second squared. But then, as the force of air resistance becomes larger, it's no longer as steep, the acceleration, as a result of the now smaller resultant force, is itself smaller, and the gradient is less steep. And it gets less steep and less steep and less steep until it hits some value of velocity that it does not um, exceed. That is the terminal velocity. And we could read it off the graph just there. Terminal velocity. So what happens when you pull the parachute? 
Well, something interesting. You increase your surface area, but that means there's suddenly now an excess of air resistance. Then you're falling with an air resistance greater than your weight, which means there is now a resultant force upwards, which slows you down. It's a deceleration. You don't fly up in the air. And if you ever see that on a video, it's because there's two, two people falling and one person pulls the parachute and the other person filming continues to fall, giving the impression that person's gone upwards. They have not. When you pull the parachute, yes, your resultant force is upwards, but all that does is it slows you down. Slows you down like this to a new lower terminal velocity. And so that's how it works.